All right, parametrization of plane curves. So of course, plane means the two-dimensional plane that we're going to be graphing on. So here is R2. And there are plenty of times where maybe some particle goes on this crazy path that would not be a function of x. But we'd still need to model that. So how do we do it? We can't do it as a function of x because it obviously breaks the, it couldn't be written as function of x or function of y. It breaks both the vertical line test and the horizontal line test. So it would not be a function of either of those two variables. So what we're gonna do is introduce a new variable and we're gonna use t for that variable. And the best way to think about t is time. So it'll be the time variable, and basically you can think of this as some particle moving around. I like to think about motorcycles moving around. So just think it's a motorcycle driving on some type of course. Or in physics, it's a particle that moves around, however you want to think about it. It's a little more boring to think about particles, so I think of something cooler. And <clears throat> we have a position function or a parameter function. So there'll be an x coordinate, and x will use the function f of t. So x keeps track of the x coordinate. We'll have a separate function, a y function, will keep track of the y or the vertical coordinate. They're both going to be functions of t. So we can put them together. x, y will be f of t comma g of t. So this will get around the issue of each x coordinate has to have its own y coordinate because there is a third variable or an input variable that both x and y depend on. So when you parameterize like this, so this is called a parameterized curve. We're almost always going to use the variable t. Sometimes you're going to see an s. So t or sometimes s will be the parameter. So our domain will be all valid t inputs for both functions. And most of the time, we're going to use a closed interval as the domain. So our domain is pretty much always going to be either a closed interval or an open interval. So we'll be looking mostly at examples that go closed from A to B. Of course, they don't have to be closed. You can have open interval A to B, and you can have a half open, half closed, or half open, half closed on the other side. Some people call these clopen, but I think that's silly. But anyways, any of them can be described as an interval, and of course they can go to infinity. You can put negative infinity or positive infinity, but you always want to use that rule. If you're going to use infinity, you're open at the infinity not close that infinity. So either of those, those A's or those B's I have arrows going to, those could be infinity or negative infinity. You're always going to be open at the infinities. All right, so those are the different choices there. And of course, if you're going to go to infinity, the graph I drew up here, both ends go to infinity. So I can already tell the domain of this would be negative infinity and positive infinity because otherwise, there would be some point where this would stop. I would not end it with an arrow. So just by the way this graph ends, or I should say the way it doesn't end, 
yeah, I'm implying that it's going to infinity and negative infinity. Yes. How do you graph endpoints that are on the graph? Well, we'll do examples of both. Okay. Uh, there's also going to be a orientation that describes which way is increasing t values, or which way would be the forwards in time. If you're watching this as as like a video or something like that. So that'll be called orientation. So it'll be arrow describing increasing t values. So before, increasing always meant to the right. When your input or your x increased, you were moving to the right, so it was really obvious. When we did a graph, for example, I'll just do like a sine or a cosine function, was graph something like that, there was an implicit go to the right that was not really drawn on there. You're always going to the right. That is no longer going to be true with parametric curves. For example, maybe it now loops around and goes back, and now we have to decide which way are we going. So there's not a natural to the right, or I should point the other way, to the right ordering. Question. So on your the example to Google that you made, um, you have arrows pointing both ways. There's so not an orientation on this one okay. yet. I just scribble something down. So one of those arrows would not be. We need to put something like that right there. So oh, okay. what that would mean is we're going. I don't want to say left, right, up, or down, but we're going the way that the four arrows are pointing, mm -hmm. where that last arrow is just indicating that it's going forever backwards too, right. if that makes sense. So these two arrows that I'm erasing, those only mean that it's going forever in those directions. Whereas the ones that, think, I think of them as one-way signs. So you're going a one-way road. It just has no beginning and no end. All right, so that's orientation. <coughs> So again, regular functions are oriented, they're just to the right. There's a natural orientation that we just don't really uh, pay attention to. So our first example, we're just going to be graphing. So we're going to sketch the curve. And afterwards, we'll find the Cartesian equation so our xy functions the first one will be t squared that's x and the y will be t plus 1 and t is going to be an interval the closed interval negative 2 to 3 so without doing any work whatever this curve looks like it's going to have two points, one at the start, one at the end, and it will have an arrow going one of the two directions. That's not what the graph looks like, but it's going to start at a point and end at a point. All right, how do you graph things that you don't know what they should look like? Guess and check. Clueless method. So clueless method, plot points, connect with the smooth curve, and the order you plotted the points, you're going to orient that direction. So our table of values is going to look slightly different. There's going to be t as the input, and then there's an x, which is t squared, and a y, which is t plus 1. And I'm going to use all the integers between negative, including negative 2 and positive 3. So when you graph, you're graphing x, y values, not t values. So T only shows up as the which direction the arrow goes. So I'll give you a minute to graph this. It should be real easy to find these values.
I just cheated and got graph paper instantly. Any graph questions on this parabola? So again, it should start and end at a point, and now I have to orient it, and hopefully you paid attention to your increasing t values as you're going down that list. So the f first one I drew was the one at the bottom, and I kind of went upwards as I graphed it, so usually two arrows will be enough to unless it's a super complicated curve that's twisting back two arrows should be plenty to describe the direction it's going. What you don't want to do is that right there. That's not a very good road. Most of you are going to be engineers. Don't do that. One-way signs pointing at each other. <laughs> if people drive on these one-way roads the wrong way, anyway. Yeah, people don't always pay attention to one-way signs, but Let's pretend that they do in this world. Okay, so there's our first graph. All right, I also want to do the second part of this, which is write a Cartesian equation. Now Cartesian, what does that word mean? So you're doing your homework and you don't know what Cartesian means, what's a good way to find out? Could ask Google. <laughs> But we laugh because who knows what's on Google. But Wikipedia, I recommend, is a very good resource. Usually one of the first three or four hits on Google is going to take you to Wikipedia. There's a couple other really good websites out there that I'm not thinking of off the top of my head. Yeah, Wolfram will tell you, usually, some pretty good information. All right, Cartesian also means rectangular. And so specifically, Cartesian is after Rene Descartes, back when the world was flat and maps were flat, which I think they still are, uh, Cartesian just meant how far you went longitudinally or horizontally and vertically. So just like our paper is laid out when you're using graph paper, it just means uh, rectangular coordinates now. All right, how in the world do we turn this into rectangular coordinates? That means only x and y, no t's at all. <clears throat> so we're going to turn this into a Cartesian equation. So this is going to only involve algebra. So I'm going to write down the x equation is t squared and our y equation is t plus 1. So we have a system of two equations with three variables. What I want to do is turn this into one equation with no t's. One equation and two variables. So I'm going to turn this into one equation. You already know how to do this. What types of algebra have you done with systems of equations? Substitution. Substitution. Elimination. Elimination. There's a third way you can put it into a matrix, but that only works with <laughs> linear equations. So if we don't have linear equations, I see a t squared, you can't put it into a matrix. You're not going to, 
we're not going to have systems of linear equations for the most part in this class. So it's either substitution or elimination. Is there an easy way to eliminate T? Mm -hmm. Solve for T in the Y. Well, that, yeah, substitution usually will work pretty well. If I used elimination, I'd have to subtract 1, then square the equation, and then... Actually, let's do elimination. That sounds way more fun. <laughs> Although that'll be solving for T squared. Yeah, let's do substitution. All right, so we'll solve for t in the second equation because it's easier. y minus 1 equals t. And then we're going to take that y minus 1 version of t and plug it into where we see t squared. All right, we're done. Difficult algebra. So would you prefer us to put it in terms of x or y? Like x equals or y equals doesn't I'd say this is, well, do you want to solve for y? You can. Because you, but all right, so we can totally solve for y, but then we get plus or minus square root x equals y minus 1. So there's solve for y. Now, which one's more useful? I can tell you which one's uglier. The square root's uglier. But when we come to uh, being useful, let's rewind way back to pre-calculus one class where we grabbed everything by hand with transformations. X equals Y squared, that's a parabola. Which way does it open? Doesn't open up or down. It's going to it's happy parabola, but this is going to open to the right. It's the inverse of y equals x squared, because x and y are trading places. So it's going to be the parabola opening to the right. So if I graphed it, regular parabola has these three points. And now, what transformation are we looking at? It's written a little bit strange. So it's a shift. How do I know it's a shift? Because it's added, subtracted. So if it was a stretch, it would be multiplied or divided. So it's going to be a shift. How do I know it's a uh, vertical, not a horizontal? Because it's, it's consider as an x, it'd be a yeah. left shift. Because I'm changing the y, not the x. If it was going to be horizontal, it would appear as x plus or minus something on next to the x. So it's going to be a vertical. <clears throat> now, whenever you perform transformations like this, it's going to be the opposite of what it looks like. So it looks like shift down one, but this is actually going to shift up one. So I don't want to go back through the whole graphing, but this very much gets back to pre-calculus one graphing transformations right here. So it's that parabola I just drew down there, shifted up one, and hopefully, now it's not the exact same graph because we actually lost information on the graph below. We lost where it starts and ends and what direction that it's traveling. So we actually have a lot more information or more specific information when we're dealing with our parameterized version right here. We have a start and end value and a direction. So there's more information that we lost when we went to rectangular that I'd have to write down, oh, we're gonna orient it up and we're going to start at this point and stop at this other point. So I need to write out more information if I wanted to actually reproduce this exact graph right here. So I should probably put a box around our, let's see, final version. So there's our rectangular equation. So we're going to do a, another example. So I don't know if I've said this before, but every example problem, I'm going to write EX underline. That means example. So I'm not going to write out the word example, just EX underline. And that, of course, could correspond to something very similar to a homework problem, which would be similar to a quiz problem or similar to a uh, midterm and final exam problem. You do need to know the different theorems, definitions I write down, but most of the questions I'm going to ask you are going to be example problems. So do, you know, solve this problem, graph it, uh, or whatever I, uh, 
right out in the example. So we're going to do the same instructions graph and convert to Cartesian. I want to change x and y. I don't want them to be what they usually are. I'm going to let x equal a sine t and y equal a cos t. Usually x is the cosine and y is the sine, but I'm intentionally switching them around so our graph looks a little bit uh, different. And our t is going to be between 0 and pi. I'm also writing it slightly different. I'm writing the x and the y equation separately and then writing in inequality notation. The first problem I wrote in point form, so it was x comma y, keeping them together. Here, just writing a slightly different form. All right, so graph, we're gonna do that by the clueless method, just using uh, plotting points. So make our table so it's pretty obvious t starts at 0. It's right from that inequality. There are a lot of values between 0 and pi we can use. So we've already had a lot of practice with trig functions, so I don't need to use every single trig value I know. So I don't have to go right to pi over 6. Let's just do pi over 4, pi over 2, 3 pi over 4, and pi. Now fractions suck if they don't have common denominators. So if you write out all the common denominators, it should be pretty obvious. Zero, zero fourths uh, pi, one fourth pi, two fourths pi, three fourths, fourths pi, four fourths pi. That's how I pick these. We don't know A. Assume A is greater than zero. Let me write that down. If A is zero, it's really boring. And if it's negative, our graph would look significantly different. So let's assume it's positive. All right, graph out these function values and orient your curve. And when you're finished with that, if you have any time, try to convert to Cartesian. And substitution is going to suck, so you should try it. And if you find out you don't know your trig values, this is a good time to start creating your cheat sheet. You can fill all your unit circle on your cheat sheet, especially at the beginning of the course, because it'll mostly be blank. substitution to convert it when you're going to graph.
Is that right? Mm -hmm. All right, so any questions on the graph here? So I had to know if A was positive or negative or else the graph would have been flipped across both axes at the same time. It would look quite different. I kind of skipped these annoying values right here because I knew it was probably going to be some type of circular thing. So I just plotted the corner points right there. Now we get to do a little bit of algebra. <clears throat> so no more questions on the graph. We're jumping into some algebra. So do the same thing, substitution. So solving for t is just as painful either equation. So I'll just solve for t in the first one. So x over a equals sine t, sine inverse x over a equals t. And now we're going to, just like before, plug that in to the t in the second equation. So that is one equation with x's and y's only. So we've accomplished writing a single rectangular equation. It's hideous, but it's a single equation, uh, x and y only. No way to get a out of there. Uh, if you just look at the graph, if I kept drawing, we're definitely looking at a circle. What should the equation be? That's correct. X squared plus Y squared equals A squared. So we're going to see that this is what it's going to simplify to. And one way is if you're looking at the graph and you know about graphs pretty well, you could write the equation right off the graph. But let's pretend that we didn't see that. Let's keep going down this windy road that we started down. How do I simplify cosine of sine inverse of x over a? We did it in pre-calculus 2 and calculus 2. There we go. We're going to draw a triangle. We're going to let this sine inverse, we're going to let theta equal sine inverse because sine inverse is going to output an angle. So it's the reverse direction of a trig function. So we're expecting it to output an angle. So to simplify, let theta equal sine inverse x over a. Move sine to the other side. Sine theta equals x over a. And now we're going to draw a triangle. Theta is right there. X is opposite a is hypotenuse. So our third side, we'll call it Y for the moment. Oh, I shouldn't call it Y. I need another letter. I'll go with B. So I have B squared. Wait. Yeah, I got to find out what B is. So B squared plus X squared equals A squared. Solve for B. B is A squared minus X squared. So regular b plus or minus square root a squared minus x squared. And for reasons I don't want to go into, mainly because we're doing an inverse function, so it outputs more, it generally outputs positive values. We're going to use a positive square root here. All right, and I'm rewriting this as a cosine, we call that whole thing theta. So what is cosine of theta in this triangle is adjacent over hypotenuse. So the adjacent is that square root a squared minus x squared. So 
So y equals a times square root a squared minus x squared over a. A's cancel. So we still have a rectangular equation. I would rather not have the square root, so I'm going to square both sides. And then add x squared. All right. Well, that was a lot of fun. It's got to be an easier way to do this. This was good practice. Good trip back through pre-calculus material. Let's find a better way. So this is a substitution. I don't think there's really another way to go with substitution. You got to solve for t, put that expression into the other equation. That's, that I think can describe every substitution where you're trying to eliminate one variable in two equations. You solve for the variable you want to eliminate, replace that variable in your other equation, and then do simplification. All right, so this is painful. Let's look at elimination instead. Can I add or subtract these two equations? Is that going to give me anything useful? Any cancellation? So back when we were dealing with linear equations, all we really had to do was add or subtract a multiple of one to the other, which is basically that's a linear operation. Multiply by a constant and add or subtract. Those are all linear operations. Sine and cosine are not linear functions. They're not quadratic functions. So we're going to think a little further outside the box. What could I add together, just looking at this side, that would simplify things? What sum of sines and cosines equals a nice number? Sine squared plus cosine squared is one. So square them, add them together, and then we can reduce it. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to square each equation, add those two together, and then that's going to reduce. Now this only comes from our trig intuition. So we're, you can't just use all those only linear moves. It's like if you try to play chess and you move things like checker pieces. It's not going to work in the chess game if you just move diagonally one spot. So we got to think about what we're dealing with. So I'll draw your brain right here. Sine squared plus cos squared equals one. So that's what you're thinking, hopefully. So the way we're going to do this, we're going to square both the equations, then add them together. Make sure you're squaring both sides of the equations, not just the trig side. All right, now we're going to add them together. So the rest kind of follows along with regular uh, elimination. We just did an operation to each equation before we added them together. So left side, x squared plus y squared. Right side, a squared sine squared theta plus a squared cos squared theta, factor the a squared out. And sine squared plus cos squared just gets eliminated here because it equals one. So you could just cross it out because we're multiplying by it, so it's like multiplying by one. All right, that was way more fun than the first way unless you're super into reducing trig that's going to work out a lot better so there's a couple other identities tangent squared plus one is secant squared so if you got tangent secant think about how those two functions are related you got to square them both and then you can not quite add them I think you subtract them you'll get plus or minus one if you play around with that equation a little bit secant and or cosecant and cotangent have a similar relationship 
So there's a couple different trig relationships out there that you can use. <clears throat> so now we're going to do a word problem. Find a parametric equation for position of a point. On the circumference of a Motorcycle tire <clears throat> So our radius will be R uh, Rolling across the surface I should go with the radius A Rolling across a surface with speed pi a. So I'm going to draw a little picture here. Here's our surface. Here's the tire. Now I did not specify where it's starting, so it probably doesn't really matter where we have it start. I'll just have it start at the very bottom, and we'll call this. Actually, I think we started on the right. That's easier. Right, it doesn't matter. We'll start at the bottom. So there's our y-axis and our x-axis. I don't know why I made the x-axis so long. Well, it didn't be that long. So I want to know how this blue dot changes position as we're rolling. I think the horizontal, the x-coordinate is more difficult. The y-coordinate is a little easier. The y-coordinate just oscillates up and down. So let's think about what kind of function could we use for the y. So it's kind of tricky because it's starting at zero and then it's going to go up to like 2a. So we can use sine or cosine. I think we're either we're going to have to transform the function. Neither of them will work just the way they are. We're also going to have to multiply it by a. So let's think about the way sine and cosine look. I'm going to trim this line down. It doesn't need to be that long. We'll start with the uh, cosine. So if I just use cosine function, I would start at one, go down, up, like that. It's one period of cosine. If I just use the sine function. It's similar. It just starts at zero, ends at zero, up, down, up. Let's go with cosine, and I'm going to use negative cosine. Flip it over. I could use a sine function, but I'd have to do a horizontal shift, and I'm just not feeling like horizontal shift. Those are a little more tricky. So we'll go cosine, but we'll use negative cosine. Negative cosine. What do I need? also need to do that function? So right now if I use negative cosine, it's going to start at negative A. Well, it's really negative a cos t. So it'll start at negative a and go to positive a. Shift it up one. I shift it up. A. 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 
So I think that's pretty much it for the y. So it'll be a minus a cos t, which of course you can factor your a out. So it's a times one minus cos t. So if I just graph the one minus cos t function out, it will start at zero, end at zero, up to two a, and it would look like that right there. So something like that. All right, so any questions on the y position that we just computed? So again, I knew it was gonna be some oscillation, so I just graph cosine and sine to think about which one would be a better starting point and then shifted it around using some transformations. Next, we're gonna think about the x. That's gonna be a little bit more difficult and we gotta wait till tomorrow. But we're gonna kinda do the same thing. We're gonna look at the oscillation part and then worry about how the speed impacts it.